We do a lot of different research projects at the Environmental Working Group on a wide range of topics. But tonight, I want to talk to you about one specific project involving 10 Americans. 10 Americans who have really been instrumental in inspiring what we consider to be one of the most important environmental campaigns in history. One day, we collected a sample of blood from each of these 10 Americans, and we sent it to a laboratory to analyze it for 413 different toxic chemical pollutants, pesticides and industrial chemicals alike. Of course, scientists have been studying pollution in air and water and land for decades, but it's only recently that they turned to the study of pollution in people. And that's what this project was designed also to do. There are hundreds and hundreds of toxic chemicals in the air in the United States, hundreds of millions of pounds emitted each year. But we know for a fact that none of these 10 Americans were exposed to these chemicals by virtue of the air that they breathed, even though we found some of these very chemicals in these 10 people. Could also have been the water that they drank, and believe it or not, some drinking water does start off looking like this before it's treated. But we know for a fact it wasn't the tap water. Of course, it could have been food that was the route of exposure. But we know for a fact that none of these 10 Americans were exposed to the chemicals we found in them as a result of food that they bought at the grocery store bought at a restaurant, and consumed. That was not the source. What about personal care products? Our online survey has shown that women use an average of about 12 personal care products a day. And that exposes them to more than 160 chemical ingredients, some of them rather toxic, day after day after day. Men, the exposure is about half that because they only use about half of the personal care products that women use. But uh, some good news, this is not a gloom and doom presentation altogether. Um, almost all of the men were found to use both deodorant and toothpaste. <laughs> so so there's, there's kind of a silver lining there. These 10 Americans weren't farm workers. They weren't factory workers. And when the results came back from the laboratory, we had found 287 chemicals in just those 10 people, an average of 200 chemicals in each one. When you look at the chemicals by category, it's kind of astonishing. 28 different waste byproducts, dioxins, furans, things that come out of incinerators, smokestacks. 47 different consumer product ingredients, the flame retardants in these lights and this projector, Teflon chemicals, Scotchgard chemicals, pesticides. But for my money, most disturbing of all, we found 212 industrial chemicals and pesticide breakdown products that had been banned 30 years before we took those blood samples and sent them to the lab in 2004. Who were these 10 Americans? How were they exposed? Well, the truth of the matter is we don't really know very much about these 10 people. About the only thing we know is that as the exposures took place, all of them looked something like this. This was the first time anyone had ever bothered since the beginning of the chemical revolution to examine umbilical cord blood to see how many toxic chemicals got through to the developing child. Here's another view. This baby is receiving about 300 quarts of blood circulating to him from the mother every day. The nutrients that are allowing the baby to grow, the oxygen that's allowing the baby to breathe, 
This baby, like all babies at that age, does not have a blood-brain barrier. That means that the tissues of the brain, the cells of the brain, are not protected as they will be in later life, just a few months from now, really, to protect him from the chemicals that would pass into those tissues and those cells. So this baby, arguably, has been at his most vulnerable for nine months at this stage. And the other thing to know about this baby, this is my baby. This is Callahan Cook, my son, who is born <laughs> a year ago. Pediatricians and scientists thought, hoped, that babies were protected from toxic chemicals because the chemicals were filtered out by the placenta. Our study showed, disturbingly, that that's not the case. Industrial pollution begins in the womb. Obviously, this is a heavy message. We are concerned about toxic chemicals to which babies in the womb are exposed. But let me also tell you, just because a chemical is found in someone does not mean that there's going to be environmental damage, biological damage. It doesn't mean that at all. But what it does mean is that there is reason to be concerned. What it does mean is that we ought to do all we can to minimize those exposures. It stands to reason. And the reason we want to avoid them is the nature of the chemicals themselves. 134 of these chemicals had been shown to cause cancer in laboratory studies or in people. 151 associated with causing birth defects. 154 caused hormone disruption. Infertility, 186 different chemicals. Immune system toxicants, 130. Neurotoxins like lead, PCBs, mercury, that we know can have profound effects on the developing child, profound effects on their intelligence, profound effects on their motor coordination. If you're doing a little math here, you're already seeing that we have more health effects than we have chemicals. Why is that? The answer is simple. Many of these chemicals have multiple toxic effects. A recent review concluded that when you look at all of these chemicals in combination, which we never do when we review their toxicity, we look at them one at a time, you have to come to a disturbing conclusion. The combined evidence suggests that neurodevelopmental disorders caused by industrial chemicals has created a silent pandemic in modern society. So what does the chemical industry say? That there's no reason to worry. Why? Because the chemicals are safe. Because the doses are so low. Parts per billion. So the question becomes, can a part per billion really cause harm? After all, a part per billion, as the industry likes to say, is equal to one pancake in a stack of pancakes 4,000 miles high. <laughs> uh, this is an actual picture that the industry took of that stack of pancakes <laughs> after they <laughs> stacked them 4,000 miles. They, they have more money than we do, but we have this cool slideshow. <laughs> One pancake in a stack 4,000 miles high. What could possibly have any impact at such a low concentration? Let's look at some chemicals that we know more about because we're exposed to them every day in advertising, and we, in many cases, use them. Albuterol. This is a chemical that's in the desk of every school nurse because one dose of it at 2.1 parts per billion will stop an asthma attack. Paxil, a common antidepressant, one dose in the blood 
active at 30 parts per billion. Cialis, one dose which can have profound therapeutic effects. <laughs> 30 parts per billion and it's good for 36 hours. <laughs> and then there's Nuvaring, which is a commonly prescribed birth control drug. It is active at 0 0.035 parts per billion. Less than four hundredths of a pancake in a stack of pancakes 4,000 miles high and it's almost 100 percent effective. Now some people are more sensitive than others. One of the side effects of Cialis at 30 parts per billion is that if you have any sudden decrease in hearing or vision, you can't see or hear at 30 parts per billion, you should stop taking Cialis and seek immediate medical help. And then there's the most famous side effect of all. <laughs> and my question about this side effect is really very simple. If you've experienced the preceding one as well, <laughs> and you can't see or hear, how do you call the doctor? <laughs> Low doses matter. For 30 parts per billion we can inspire human reproduction. For 0 0.035 parts per billion we can prevent it, and for another 30 parts per billion we can chill out about it either way. <laughs> the exposures happen, industry is allowed to sell these chemicals, use them in the marketplace, and we have to wonder, after decades of these exposures, what the problems that they're causing might just be. There are increases in diseases, disorders, health problems that we cannot explain by genetics alone. We're not evolving so quickly that these problems can be explained an 84 percent increase in acute lymphocytic leukemia in children between 1975 and 2002. Hypospadias has doubled over roughly that same period. This is a birth defect, a deformation of the penis, where the urethra doesn't come out at the end but somewhere else along the shaft, and it requires surgery often within days or months of birth. That now affects one out of 125 baby boys in the United States. Chemicals are implicated. A 57 percent increase in childhood brain cancer. Autism, the great mystery, the great tragedy. One in 150 children on the autism spectrum disorder. One in 150 children. In some states where we have more robust data, it's approaching 1 percent. It's not just the kids. It's adults too. Millions of couples struggle with getting pregnant or carrying a pregnancy to full term. A dramatic increase of 20 percent in those problems in the past decade. The biggest increase has been with women of childbearing age under 25 years old. Decreased sperm count in men, about 1 percent per year in the United States and Northern Europe. Breast cancer. Does anyone here not know a person, a family, that has been touched by this disease now? One in eight women. And for all cancers, one in three women will develop them during their lifetime, and half of all men. So what can you do? All these chemicals, all these exposures, well, one thing we know for certain, you can't live under a rock. You can't avoid modern life. You can't <laughs> escape. You can't escape all of these expo- Would you like to see that again? <laughs> we can't avoid these exposures. We live in the real world. 
And we're not proposing for one minute that we try and live anywhere else, but we need to fix that real world and we can do it. Chemicals are showing up on the front page of newspapers for the same reason that they're showing up in babies. A very weak law that was passed a long time ago and has never since been modernized. It's the Toxic Substances Control Act, and my message to you tonight is, we need to fix this thing. The Toxic Substances Control Act grandfathered in 62,000 industrial chemicals in 1976 and presumed that they were safe. The law does not require any health or safety studies before a new chemical is allowed onto the market. None. Of the chemicals that come to EPA for approval, 80% are approved within just three weeks. And in the history of Tosca, as it's called, only five chemicals, only five, have been banned or restricted. This law is so weak that when the first Bush administration tried to ban asbestos, it was challenged in court and lost. This is a law that protects polluters. It protects companies. It protects profits. And what we need is a law that protects people and public health. It's a tall order, but we've made big changes before. We've cleaned up industries, we've cleaned up air, we've cleaned up water, but most relevant to tonight, we've cleaned up our blood. Lead. When we took the lead out of gasoline, look what happened to blood lead levels in the U.S. population. They plummeted. We still have a problem with lead poisoning in inner cities, in older housing, particularly low-income housing. But we've made dramatic strides by taking lead out of both paint and gasoline. PCB levels in blood. At the time it was detected in people and wildlife, it was suggested that if we got rid of this insulating chemical, we might not have electricity. Well, we did ban it. The lights are still on. <laughs> and PCB levels in blood plummeted. And then there's DDT, the notorious insecticide. The industry, of course, said, well, if you ban DDT, we might not be able to grow food. But we did ban it. We did continue to grow food, and DDT levels plummeted in the American people's blood. As an important note, when we tested those babies in 2004, we still found PCBs. We still found DDT. The lesson is pretty clear. If a chemical is dangerous and it lasts a long time in the environment, you want to waste no time moving to take it off of the market. For the past five years, a campaign has been building to protect the most vulnerable, to protect all of us. It's called the Kids Safe Chemicals Act. And here's what this law, in summary, would do if it got on the books, and we want it on the books. It would require that chemicals be proven by the companies to be safe for children and others who are sensitive before the chemicals are allowed on the market. What a concept. It assumes that chemicals are harming people until it's proven otherwise, until they're proven safe by the companies. Now it goes the other way. If you've got tens of thousands of chemicals, where do you start trying to unravel the problem? Well, this bill says let's start with chemicals that we have reason to believe are hazardous and end up in people. And this is where the 10 Americans come in. This bill says that if chemicals show up in umbilical cord blood, we're going to assume they're unsafe. And we're going to require the companies that make those chemicals to prove that they are safe on an expedited basis before they can come onto the market or remain on the market. And that's what we hope the Kids Safe Chemicals Act will do. Scientists, medical leaders, 
religious leaders, environmental organizations are coming together and it's the most exciting development in my professional life dealing with toxic chemicals and the problems they cause. This is another image of my baby, Callahan Cook. He's about two weeks old. When I look into his face, I see every hope for a healthy future. I know that when he came into the world, like all American babies, he did have some toxic chemicals in him for all our best efforts. But my hope is that going forward, we can do better and we have to do better. We can protect babies and the rest of us from these toxic chemicals if we just make it our business to do so. Yes, be smarter when you shop. But even more importantly tonight, get involved to help us pass the Kids Safe Chemicals Act. We owe it to our kids. We owe it to ourselves to protect them so that no baby is born into this world pre-polluted in the future. Thank you.